Hi, everyone. I'm Kim. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for Washington County Solid Waste and Recycling. Um, I'm joined today by Maycel, who's one of our Community Outreach Specialists. Hi, Maycel. Um, and then we also have Kate and Heather from our team joining us. Uh, Kate is going to be our tech support. So if you're having any issues um, with audio or anything like that, go ahead and drop um, a question in the chat and Kate will reach out and try to assist you with that. And then we also have Heather's gonna be monitoring our Q&A. So when you look at your toolbar, you should have a Q&A button with two little chat comments above it. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to drop them in there. And then uh, Heather will try and answer them while we're going. And then at the very end, we'll have some time to open it up for um, question and answers with everyone. So that's sort of the housekeeping to start with. All right, so you might have noticed um, all of your microphones should be muted and your video is not turned on. And we ask that you keep those settings for the whole presentation. And um, just to let you know the presentation will be recorded. Um, and we hope to be able to share that out later afterwards. Uh, like I mentioned before, please add questions to the Q&A function. So questions go in the Q&A and then any tech issues that you're having, please go to the chat and Kate will help you there. Um, for best viewing in Zoom, you can select side-by-side -side mode or dock uh, the participants to the side or the bottom of the screen so you can see the full screen while you're watching. And then feel free to send questions or feedback to Maycel or myself. Those are our email addresses there. So we're scheduled for an hour, but um, if there are lots of questions at the end, we're happy to stay on a little bit longer and help answer them. So great, let's get started. So for this presentation, we'll be covering some of the basics of recycling, um, a market overview, the flow of materials, and what recycling of specific materials get made, gets made into here in Oregon. And we're going to be doing a few polls during this presentation, so we're going to practice. So for our first poll, please let us know how you heard about the presentation. Great, so Kate's got that poll launched. Great, looks like we've got almost everyone in there. So looks like most people heard about it from the newsletter, Garbage and Recycling Day app or other. So awesome, thank you for sharing that information and practicing the poll with us. All right, so we're gonna kick it off with how recycling works. So before I started working here, I used to think, you know, I would put out my recycling and sprinkle it with a little unicorn sparkle um, and I'd be saving the planet and that was it. And it turns out that it's a little more complicated than that. So here's some of the steps that go into the recycling process. So you're probably pretty familiar with the first step. Recycling goes out to the curb um, or to the enclosure at your home or workplace. And then the garbage and recycling company comes and picks it up. They take it to a material recovery facility, or you can call it a MRF, MRF, if you want to sound super cool and in the know, where it's sorted and baled and sold to a processor um, and then sent along to be made into new products. So those are the, those last few steps. So that's the full process of recycling is not just putting it in the bin, but going through all those steps to where it gets made into something new. Now, taking a closer look at kind of how it flows through our region, um, this is the process of how materials go through the system and where they end up. So mixed recycling and glass on that top line, um, like we said, gets picked up, it's taken to the MRF, it's sorted, baled, and then it's transported either domestically um, or overseas for processing. And sometimes the materials end up uh, overseas in communities that don't have the capacity to handle it or don't have the capacity to handle all of the garbage and contamination that can end up in the recycling. Um, and this can cause a lot of problems for the local community and for workers. Other materials that are collected are processed here in Oregon um, or in other domestic locations. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, materials recovered, transported, processed, and made into new materials is the full process. 
then garbage is picked up um, from residential, or you can do drop off, picked up or dropped off from residential and commercial com customers at a transfer station. Um, that is sort of the middleman in the process. Once the garbage is on the tipping floor of the transfer station, sometimes there are folks who will pull out, uh, who will glean materials that might still be recyclable or reusable. And then from there, the remaining waste is loaded onto long haul trucks and taken to Coffin Butte in Benton County or to Columbia Ridge Recycling and Landfill in Arlington, Oregon, where it gets dumped and managed for long term disposal. And then finally, yard debris and food scraps are picked up and uh, sometimes taken to a transfer station, sometimes go directly to either a biogas plant or a compost facility here in Oregon. And currently, much of the region's food scraps and yarn debris is processed into compost um, and sold for commercial application and also to the general public in terms of use. So who's responsible for what? Uh, there's a lot of players within the system of moving materials around the region. So we're Washington County Solid Waste and Recycling, um, and we provide educational resources, outreach, policy compliance and regulatory oversight that guides both community members and businesses on what and how to dispose of materials properly. Uh, private companies like Waste Management or Hillsborough Garbage, whoever you might have, um, are responsible for picking up the materials, whether that's garbage, recycling, food scraps, or yard debris, and then transport those materials to transfer stations and MRFs. And then the materials are transported by a different company, different private long haul company and disposed of in the landfill. So this is a picture of what a typical material recovery facility looks like, a MRF. And this is where mixed recycling goes to be sorted. So some of it is done by machines, but some of it is still done by hand. And when there are things in the recycling that shouldn't be there, uh, what we call contamination, it has to be sorted out, which is expensive and can slow down the process. Um, it can also cause harm to equipment and to workers. For example, uh, we talk a lot about plastic bags and film. Um, plastic bags get wrapped around the gears that move the machinery through the MRF, and then the sorting equipment has to be shut down, um, and workers have to go and actually physically cut out those plastic bags and film from the machinery, um, and it's dangerous and it's expensive, so please don't put plastic bags and film in the mixed recycling, uh, take it to a drop-off location, or put it in the garbage. All right, these are some workers who are hand sorting on a line. So a big question um, is why can some things be recycled and not others? Uh, and it's a complicated question, um, but a simple answer is that there has to be a way to sort the material and there has to be a way to sell it. So not all materials collected have markets. In order for anything to be recycled, um, someone needs to want to use it to make other things. It's a question of supply and demand. So is there a demand for a certain material? Um, and is there a demand for the end product by consumers? So when you buy things that have recycled content, you help close that recycling loop um, and drive that uh, demand. And technology can also be a factor in thinking about what can be recycled. Materials need to be easily sorted from other materials and the material also needs to be able to stand up to the recycling process um, and to make environmental and economic sense. These are bales of recyclable materials that are ready to be shipped out to the market uh, to be sold to processors and the manufacturers that do the recycling. So it's pretty cool. You can see there's lots of lots of stuff packed in there. So you might remember National Sword. Um, it was a there was a big recycling disruption back in 2018 due to China imposing their National Sword policy, which placed restrictions on global imports of materials, um, including imports from Oregon. The recycling industry was caught off guard, um, and it resulted in uh, many MRFs being left with large piles and bales of recycling. Um, a very small amount of which ended up uh, being landfilled. And these restrictions were really challenging for markets around the world to adapt to and for markets in Oregon to adapt to. Um, but it has allowed China and other countries to focus on their own anti-pollution and anti-corruption efforts. So where do our plastics go now? Uh, this graph provides a glimpse into where our plastics were going in the first six months of 2019 um, compared to the same time period in 2020. Uh, which is pretty interesting. So overall, U.S. exports of scrap plastics decreased by about 18% in the first part of 2020 compared to the first six months of 2019. China is no longer among the top importers of scrap plastics due to the national sword changes. 
Um, most of the major export markets for scrap plastic saw declines uh, with a few exceptions. Um, Malaysia and Vietnam both saw um, pretty significant increases. And then uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, and you'll see a big difference for India too, have all sort of increased the scrutiny on their plastic imports um, in recent years to make sure that they can also, with similar reasons to China, just to make sure that they can handle the material that's coming in in a way that's responsible for workers and for the environment. So we wanna make sure that uh, we're not exporting garbage to other countries and that if our recyclables are headed overseas that they are you know, being processed in the right way. All right, so our next slide is about what's happening in Oregon and we're gonna do another quick poll. So we're gonna have, if Kate would be so kind as to launch poll number two, there we go. So true or false, the items accepted in the mixed recycling in the Portland metro region have changed in the last five years. Please take a, a second. Oh, I see them coming in. Good work. All right, it looks like most people have voted. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. So we have about 70% saying true, about 30% saying false. So this is actually false. Um, nothing has changed about what's being accepted in the mixed recycling in the Portland metro region in the last five years. Um, some rural parts of Oregon did have did change. Um, I think most notably, some stopped accepting glass because it can be very heavy and expensive to transport. Um, but in the Portland metro area, um, it has stayed the same. And there's actually an effort underway right now to modernize Oregon's recycling system. Um, DEQ has been, Department of Environmental Quality has been a really big uh, player in that. And one of the major outcomes could be a list of materials, of accepted materials that's consistent throughout the entire state. So as for post-national sword related impacts, for the most part in our region, um, Oregon's MRFs have tried to, have moved away from Asian end markets. Um, although one or two of Oregon's MRFs still deal with uh, some unique overseas markets. Most, although not all, um, material is processed, that is processed in states, so sorted here in Oregon, um, is headed to a domestic end market. And I'll share some more info about what our recycled materials are becoming on the next slide. So COVID-19 has definitely impacted commodity prices, uh, some for good, some for not so good. Um, as of late July 2020, um, paper fiber has increased. So a lot of that is um, boxes, is people doing more online shipping, getting things sent to them, um, and having a, lot, a big increase in cardboard. And then glass, there we go, glass, metal, um, and most plastics has decreased. So recycling in Oregon, what does it become? So here's just a few of the things. Paper fiber can be made into container board, copy paper, insulation, craft paper, napkins, uh, paper towels, tissue, toilet paper, and packaging. Plastics, um, including plastic film, can be made into agricultural and automotive parts, carpet, composite lumber, sheeting, flooring, lawn and garden products, um, and different kinds of pipes. Glass mainly becomes new bottles and jars um, and insulation, and uh, can also be used as a cement additive in the manufacture of concrete and used as daily cover, alternate daily cover in landfills. And then metal, both ferrous and non-ferrous, so steel um, as well as aluminum, copper, all that good stuff um, are made into all other kinds of products. And the act of refining metal has gotten better and better. Um, and scrap material uses, has a lower, lower melting point um, than virgin material. So there's a lot less energy used for the recycling process um, when you use recycled metal. So the big takeaway here is that recycling is still happening. Um, nothing has changed in the Portland metro area. And just keep, we just wanna make sure that everyone is doing it correctly. So next up, Maisel is going to talk a little bit about taking an upstream approach to materials management. Thank you, Kim. Next. So 
So recycling is one of the easiest, most feel-good environmental actions you can take, right? It's so tangible. You hold something in your hand, rinse or prepare it properly, put it in the recycling container, and you know you're doing the right thing. And in a broad sense, recycling is part of an ethic of, ethic of resource efficiency, of using products to their fullest potential. When a recycled material, rather than a raw material, is used to make a new product, natural resources and energy are conserved. Next slide. And you should feel good. Recycling saves natural resources and energy. Let's look at some examples and we'll start with aluminum. Recycling of aluminum cans saves 95% of the energy required to make the same amount of aluminum from its virgin source. And it reduces the destruction of natural areas from mining for bauxite to produce those virgin materials. Next slide. Recycling a steel soup can saves at least 75% of the energy it would take to make a new steel soup can from raw virgin materials. And fun fact, one metal can can actually be recycled an infinite amount of times. Recycling also reduces mining, logging, and oil dependence. For example, by recycling paper, Residents in the metro region save 8.2 million trees from being harvested. Click. This is equivalent to the number of trees in eight forest parks. Next slide. But recycling is not the best thing you can do. It actually sits in the middle of the hierarchy. So this means that you should not only look for items that can be recycled, but also consider how you can reduce the amount of waste you produce, the stuff that you buy, and reuse the materials as much as possible before thinking about recycling. Next. Every item you buy has an environmental impact. The majority of these impacts come before you even buy it, which are the steps circled in yellow in this graphic all of which impact that product's environmental footprint. The solutions we need involve how we manage discards, but also how we buy, how we use stuff, how businesses design and make and sell stuff. That's a lot harder to do, but if we want a healthy environment, we don't have any choice but to look at these bigger issues. So focusing on what you buy is more important than focusing on where it goes when you're done with it. By only thinking about an item's recyclability, we don't take into account the entire environmental impact. So let's dig deeper into that in this next example. Next slide. So remember, recycling is definitely good for the environment. So you might intuitively believe that more recycling is better for the environment. And in order to recycle more, we need a more recyclable waste stream. And so therefore, packaging that is easier to recycle will be better than packaging that is difficult to recycle. And that assumption can be checked using an accounting tool called a life cycle assessment or LCA. An LCA quantifies the environmental impacts of a material across its full life. So here's one specific example from the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, or we, as we may know, DEQ that shows how recycling might not always be the best environmental choice. Here we see three types of coffee containers, a plastic pouch that can't be put into the mixed recycling bin, a plastic round container that can be put into the mixed recycling bin, the lid is garbage of course, and a metal container that can be put into the mixed recycling bin, the lid of course is garbage. Now we need to dig in more and look beyond recycling to see the true impact each item has on its environment. The energy consumption required to manufacture the non-recyclable pouch is 4.5 times lower than, recycled than the recyclable plastic round container and four times lower than the metal container. The non-recyclable pouch produces four times less CO2 than the plastic tub and eight times less CO2 emissions than the recyclable metal container. The solid waste generation is also much lower for, th for the non-recyclable pouch because it takes up a lot less space in the landfill. So while looking for products that are recyclable is generally good, there are, 
there are also other things to consider. Now let's look at another example, a plastic disposable water bottle versus a plastic reusable bottle filled with tap water. Now this information came from a life cycle study done by the Oregon DEQ that evaluated the impact of delivering 1000 gallons of drinking water to consumers in both in either a disposable or reusable water bottle. This study also included the end of life management of the containers and packaging. And the goal of the study was to understand the environmental impact of that 1000 gallons of water in these two different containers. Next slide. The DEQ study can be found online and it contains many more details than I'll share here today. But let's get into the simplified examples of the environmental impact of single use and reusable water bottles. Click. In this first example, the bottle is recycled after use 62% of the time. The green circle represents the environmental impact, which includes the material extraction and processing, manufacturing, transportation, distribution, and end of life management. And since this study took place over a number of years, multiple bottles were used. In the second scenario, the bottle is thinner than the first example, and it's recycled at the same rate. Now, a thinner bottle means that less resources were used to produce the bottle. And as we can see when comparing this green circle to the previous bottle's environmental impact, the negative impact gets even smaller. In the third example, we switch to a reusable water bottle that is washed daily in an inefficient home dishwasher, which failed EPA's Energy Star program by the greatest margin ever, which is the worst case scenario when it comes to washing reusable bottles. In this worst case scenario, it has a smaller negative impact than either of the single use water bottle examples. And finally, we see an example of the same reusable bottle washed weekly in an efficient dishwasher, which we will call the best case scenario when it comes to washing reusable water bottles. The negative environmental impact is small, almost too small to see in this example. Next slide. So again, let's revisit. The disposable bottle is recycled at a rate of 62% and the reusable bottle is reused over and over and washed once a week in an energy efficient dishwasher. Here you can see the relative global warming potential for the both bottles in green. Look how much the environmental impact decreases when you choose the reusable water bottle. You can achieve 98% less global warming potential, aka negative environmental impacts, by simply using a durable water bottle and washing it once a week instead of using a disposable bottle and recycling it. And that's even more true of most things where the end of life carbon impact is very low compared to the carbon impact of making, shipping, and using the item. For all materials consumed in Oregon, end of life represents only about 1.5% of greenhouse gas emissions. So in these examples, the pair of jeans, computer, and beef, you can see how small the purple portion is, which is the end of life carbon emissions in comparison to the production and even use. The production is the green and the use is blue. So it's not just about what you do with a product when you're done with it. Next slide. So let's recap. Recycling is good. It's important to support the market by recycling correctly. Reducing and reusing are even better than recycling. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. As you all know, single use disposable items are everywhere and a pervasive part of our culture. This is even more true since the COVID-19 pandemic started last year. Some businesses have banned the use of reusable shopping bags, coffee mugs, and other containers. Even though there isn't any evidence that disposable items reduce the spread of the virus, we can give businesses and staff a break at our grocery stores, coffee shops, and other retail locations, and remain hopeful that these changes won't last forever and that we'll be allowed to use our reusable items again. Some businesses have already lifted their bans and have been allowing the use of reusables. So there is hope. Now I will talk about some ways that you can make a difference. Before we talk about how to recycle, let's take some time with the first two R's, reduce and reuse. And we include repair with reuse. So ask yourself these questions before purchasing or throwing out items. Do I need this? Have I used this until it's absolutely worn out? Now let's cover how to reduce and reuse. Now the best option is reduce. 
some people make this one into refuse. So don't feel pressured. So um, some ways to reduce. Don't feel pressured to buy something because of a sale or to take a free gift if you don't need it. We all have the kitchen drawer stuffed with soy sauce packets, plastic spoons from takeout, maybe even boba straws. When picking up to-go food, make sure you say no to disposable items that you don't need. If giving away swag, whether it's for a business event or party favors post-COVID, make sure you're giving something that people will want, will actually use, and likely don't already have. And don't choose to use one-time use items. There are still options to buy in bulk, choose items with less or no packaging like shampoo bars and bring your own container when you can. Next slide. Now the next best option, reuse. There are tons of places in Portland Metro area where you can buy, sell or donate used items. Many of them are open again. Just make sure to call or check their website ahead of time for any COVID related changes to hours or protocols. You can borrow books, music, movies, toys, tools, kitchenware, and more at various Portland lending libraries and at Washington County libraries. Uh, maybe somebody can drop the link for resourcefulpdx.com. Local groups like Buy Nothing on Facebook are a great resource for finding and giving items for free. You can agree on delivery options that you and the recipient feel comfortable with. And maintenance is important for more than your car. Take care of other items to keep them in good condition and repair items to give them a longer life. Most in-person repair fairs are on hold right now, but there are lots of great YouTube tutorials on how to make simple repairs and men clothing. And you can follow us on Facebook to see some of the great tips we've shared on how to extend the life of your wardrobe. And now we'll do on our another poll. True or false, can you make a belt out of recycled watches? <laughs> now the results true it would take it would make a great tick tock and false, who thought of these terrible recycling puns? Hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. And now I'll turn it back over to Kim to talk about what goes where. Thanks, Michelle. And actually, we have another poll. So Kate, if you mind, wouldn't mind launching this one? Are you a wishful recycler? So this is sort of your pretest. We're gonna see if you know which items should and shouldn't be going in the recycling and then we'll, we'll do a more in-depth cover in a second. All right, looks like we've got the results in. So the first question, paper, cape, paper, me, paper cups and plates can go in the mixed recycling. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, the next question, hand, sanit hand sanitizer bottles and disinfecting wipe containers can go in the mixed recycling. Those two examples you see there, the answer is yes, um, but you would have to take the tops and the pump part off. Those would go in the garbage. Uh, clamshell style packaging can go in the mixed recycling. Uh, looks like you all did really well with that one. The answer is no. Plastic bags and film can go in the mixed recycling. Good work, that's correct. The answer is no. 
All right. So now for the real reason everyone came to the presentation, we'll review what is and is not accepted in the mixed recycling. As a quick overview, plastic, paper, and metal goes in the mixed recycling bin, uh, and glass should, uh, glass should always go in a separate bin. So we're going to start with plastic. In the Portland metro area, for plastic, we recycle based on the shape of an item, not the number on the item. That number isn't really meant for the consumer. It's meant for the end recipient, um, the company that will recycle it into a new product. And while that number can give you some information about the product, it actually doesn't give you enough to know if it's accepted in your local recycling program. So just because something has the chasing arrow on it um, on the, the product or packaging, it doesn't mean that it can go in the mixed recycling bin. So with plastic, we like to talk about bottles, buckets, and round containers. So a bottle is an item where the top is narrower than the base, and then it often has thread lines at the top, so like a shampoo bottle or the milk jug. Um, round containers that are six ounces or larger that used to hold items like sour cream or salsa, so you see a cottage cheese container up there, those can go in and the lids go in the garbage. And then plastic buckets that are five gallons or smaller, um, you know, kitty litter, things like that, that come in those big five gallon buckets. Those are also great for reuse. So you might see if somebody wants those before you recycle them, but you can put them in the recycling. Um, and don't worry if it has that little handle on it, that's okay. You don't have to pull that off. With flower pots, flower pots have to be four inches or larger. Um, and they have to be rigid plastic, not that kind of crinkly, crinkly plastic that seedlings and things come in. So those flower pots kind of fall under that round, round container rule. So when it comes to plastics, I like to tell people to focus on what goes in as opposed to what doesn't. Um, if it's not a bottle, bucket, or round container, it probably isn't accepted in your mixed recycling. Um, and if in doubt, throw it out. As we talked about earlier, it's kind of, it's better. We want um, to keep our recycling as clean as possible. So if you come in plastic items that are definitely no-nos for your mixed recycling, um, the clamshells, which sounds like everyone's heard about, um, did really well on that question. Single-use utensils like these spoons, um, plastic beverage cups, and lids and straws are all garbage. So next we have paper. I, I like talking about paper because I feel like I'm always giving people bad news um, with the plastic about what's not accepted. And with paper, sometimes I get to surprise people uh, with a few things that are accepted. So with paper, it includes newspapers, magazine, uh, magazines, office or scrap paper, mail, envelopes, the windows, those little windows on your bills, that's fine. Um, cartons that used to hold things like milk, juice, or broth, um, just give them a good rinse first, and flattened cardboard boxes, um, toilet paper tubes, all accepted. Um, some paper-ish paper, paper -ish items that are not accepted, to-go food boxes are not accepted, uh, paper coffee cups, both that cup and that lid are garbage. If it has that little, little uh, sleeve around it, that cardboard sleeve, that's okay, that can go in. Um, paper napkins, paper towels are not allowed, um, and paper plates are not allowed. So next we have metal um, that can also go in the mixed recycling bin. So aluminum, tin, steel cans, uh, M foil, and scrap metal. So your pro recycling tip is if you have some small metal pieces like lids or bottle caps, um, you can put them in a larger can like that image and then crimp the top shut when you're done and that'll keep all those little pieces in and stop them from falling out while it's being sorted. Uh, for paint cans, so that's an empty paint can if it has less than an inch of dried paint. Um, if you can peel out the paint, also even better. If there's a little bit, that's okay, um, but those can go in. And if there's actually paint in it still, that needs to go to a paint care facility. All right, so onto glass recycling. So glass bottles and jars go in a separate bin. And with, with glass, we're really looking for food grade glass bottles and jars. Um, please remove the lids. If they're metal, you can do what we just talked about, popping them in the can. And um, if they're plastic, throw them out. The labels are okay. You don't have to scrape off the labels. Um, no broken glass and no uh, incandescent light bulbs in the mixed recycling. Those should go in the garbage. Other kinds of glass that shouldn't go in the recycling are you know, window glass, glass uh, servingware, candle jars, vases, 
anything that's not that food grade glass has a different melting point. So when it gets ground up and goes in with all the other, with the glass that is food grade and they melt at different temperatures then it just creates kind of a big sticky mess. So just those food grade, um, the color doesn't matter, clear, green, brown, that's all fine. Next up is yard debris. So if you have a yard debris collection at home, um, weeds, leaves, vines, uh, grass clippings, if you're like me, all of the house plants that you've killed, uh, flowers, branches less than four inches in diameter and shorter than 36 inches in length, all of that can go in your yard debris bin. Um, some things that should not go in include any Anything labeled compostable or biodegradable, um, serviceware, containers, uh, cups, forks, none, none of that should go in. Um, no yard tools, although I assume that happens, that's kind of an accident. No, not a lot of dirt, you know, if a little bit's on the roots, that's fine, but don't load it up with dirt, rocks. Um, no poop, human or otherwise, no dog poop, no human poop, um, bagged or not, just no poop um, and no garbage. Uh, next, food scraps. So if you live in the cities of Beaverton, Hillsboro, or Forest Grove, or if you work at a business that has food scrap collection, um, you might be able to include food scraps. And since that doesn't apply to everyone, um, and because there are some differences between businesses and homes, I'm just going to go over a few basics now. But if you have more questions, we can get to those up in the end in the Q&A. So for most commercial programs, so if you are doing food scraps at work, um, only food is accepted and nothing else. If you are at home and you're doing food scrap mixed in with your yard debris, all food is accepted. Meat, dairy, veggies, fruit, uh, bones, eggshells, coffee grounds, tea bags, um, cooked food and leftovers. We say, if it grows, it goes. Um, and I know sometimes people have heard about not putting in bones or meat or things like that. That's really more if you're trying to do home composting um, and there's some reasons behind that. But if you're, if you're getting your food scraps picked up um, with your yard debris and if it grows, it goes, you can put all that in there. Um, for residential food scraps, you can include greasy pizza boxes um, and food soiled napkins and paper towels. And then again, even if you have food scraps collection, please don't include paper or plastic cups or plates, no takeout containers, no items labeled as compostable, no plastic bags, no, no dog poop, um, no diapers, um, and any form of composting program. And the reason for the no compostable serviceware, I know people often have questions about that, um, there aren't uniform standards for what can be labeled as compostable um, and different compost systems work different ways. So just because it has that label doesn't actually mean that it will break down in our system. Um, and it can cause problems because if it doesn't break down fully and then you go and you buy, you know, your bag of compost at the nursery and it has little bits of non broken down um, cups in it, that's not ideal. So um, please, the, the, the food scraps are really what compost facilities are looking for. So that's really what, what they want you to put in. All right, and then if you want to use a liner, um, it has to be a BPI certified liner, um, no plastic garbage bags. The liners aren't super necessary. There's, they're, they can be a little spendy, um, and there's other ways to get around that. You can line it with a single you know, piece of newspaper. Um, I keep my food scraps in the freezer and then dump them out once a week, and I don't have a liner. Um, you can, there's different kinds of containers with like the charcoal filter that helps keep smell down. So. You can use a liner if you want, the BPI ones um, are, are accepted, but if you don't want to spend the money, you don't have to do that. All right, so that was a lot of information. Thank you for sticking with us. I see the Q&A in the chat kind of lighten up, so we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but I want to share some tools that we have to help you recycle right. So on our website, we have a what to recycle and where tool where you can enter in um, the item that you want to dispose of and see the options that are available to you. Um, you can also see special events happening near you, special recycling events, um, and you can see your service schedule if you don't live in a multifamily um, complex. You can also download our Garbage and Recycling Day app onto your phone. Um, you can see your collection schedule. You can get notifications when there's a change in schedule due to weather or holidays. Um, and you can find out the what to recycle and where tool is also available on the app. Um, so Kate, if you wouldn't mind, or maybe you already have, popping in the links to those into the chat. Um, definitely recommend downloading the app. It's, it's super useful and then you always have it with you. Um, but if you prefer, you can also use the online tool. 
All right. And if you're interested in learning more, it's Earth Month. Happy Earth Month, everyone. So we do have some more events coming up and we'd love to have you join us. So tomorrow we have um, in our Latte and Learn series uh, um, webinar tomorrow at, at uh, sorry, tomorrow April 7th at 2.30. And the topic is green schools. So if you are an educator, if you're on the green team, at your child's school, if you're just interested in kind of learning more about what happens, um, what kind of sustainability efforts are happening at schools, uh, please join us for that. And Kate's kind of put the link to all of these events um, for our website in the, in the chat as well. Uh, we're excited. We're going to be launching something called the Goose Chase Earth Week and Beyond Challenge. So Goose Chase is an app that you can download. And we have a lot of really fun missions and an opportunity to earn points and prizes. That's going to be launched during Earth Week. Um, so stay tuned. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, sign up for the newsletter if you haven't already. And we're going um, we're gonna to be announcing the kickoff to that soon. So we're excited about that. And then there are webinars happening every Tuesday in April um, in English at noon and five, and then in, in Spanish at six. So next week's is Beyond the Bin. So if you enjoyed some of our information about options for reuse and repair and reduce and some of the R's other than recycling, that's really what next week's gonna get into. So I'd encourage you to sign up for that. Um, April 20th, we're doing the Eat Smart Waste Less Challenge, which is about uh, food waste prevention at home. And you'll have the opportunity to actually take the challenge with a group of other people uh, measure your food waste for four weeks and follow some of our tips and suggestions to see if you can uh, challenge yourself to waste less food at home. And then April 27th, uh, our partners at Metro are going to join us and give a presentation on healthy homes and green cleaners. Um, there are some great recipes for non-toxic cleaners, um, and that'll be a really fun one as well. Those are all the things that we have coming up. Um, like I said, it's on our website, and um, you can head there to sign up for any of these options. And we'll finish by saying you're awesome and you can make a difference. We appreciate you all and we're, we're so happy that you came here to join us today to learn more about recycling. And then we're going to do questions. So I know that um, Heather has been monitoring the Q&A. So if uh, Heather wants to unmute and kind of, Kate and Heather are going to see what's coming in and then um, share some of those with myself and I to answer, answer out loud. Yeah, let me, uh, oh, I hear an echo. Um, I have a few more questions here that I haven't been able to answer um, uh, on the, on the Q&A thing. So I'll just go ahead and go through those and you can answer those um, out loud if that's okay. All right. Sure. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's start with this one. Um, so I have one actually that I'm answering right now. It's uh, can paper plates and cups be put in the recycling if they're not used? So if they're clean? Um, the answer is no. They still, they still would prefer to not have that material. Yeah, and that's usually because there's either a, a very thin plastic lining like in cups or the paper fiber has been treated with a chemical just to make sure that your plate or your cup doesn't disintegrate in your hand um, when you're holding something wet or you know you're, you have something obviously like a drink or um, your food isn't kind of soaking through the, the paper plate. All righty. Um, how about this one? So there are some packing peanuts that aren't polystyrene, but they're made of a starch. Um, what should people do with those? So good question. Um, my recommendation, so they, they can't be recycled, unfortunately, um, and they prefer not to get them in the compost either. So I would say to reuse them um, or they can go in the garbage. If you're part of your Buy Nothing group, um, there are um, like local businesses on Buy Nothing groups that are looking for um, packing peanuts, um, the pack packaging, anything materials. Um, and they will collect them, pick them up from people who choose to um, save them for those folks. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I have one here, and I think this is this might be an interesting one to address. So it's kind of this idea that the recycling program was meant to keep things out of the ocean, 
but why are we asking people to throw things in the garbage as the alternative? So this one is specifically about straws. So can you kind of um, clarify how things are ending up in the ocean versus you know, what happens to things when they actually end up in the landfill or in the garbage? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll try to give a, a, a brief answer to that one. So um, what was happening um, and with, which National Sword was sort of designed to help um, decrease was that we were putting a lot of things in our recycling that weren't supposed to be in there, um, that didn't have any value, that were never going to get recycled, um, like the clamshells and those other things where we're recycling and putting them in there and hoping for the best. And because of the way shipping routes worked, it was really cheap to send um, to send that all over to China. And we sort of were like, all right, we're, you know, we'll hope for the best. China will sort it out and deal with it. And we don't have to worry about it. And then what was happening was that um, China was getting a lot of this material. Much of it wasn't recyclable. Much of it was garbage. And not all of their facilities were managing it correctly. So they would sort out the things that were recyclable, um, which are the things those are the things that we're asking people to put in the bin. And then the garbage wasn't always ending up being managed responsibly. So some of that is how it was getting into the ocean was that it was being um, disposed of imp improperly. Um, and the same thing is happening now when it's getting exported to, to other countries that maybe don't have the infrastructure to deal with it. Or um, sometimes there's people who just go through and take out the good stuff, the stuff that's valuable, and the rest of the stuff ends up getting dumped in rivers or waterways or burned or other things like that. So um, basically, if you, a lot of times if you recycle something, it ends up being a really expensive and you know, potentially environmentally problematic way to dispose of it. Whereas you know, we have really well-managed landfill systems in our country. So when you put something in the garbage and it goes to the landfill, it gets, it gets managed properly. It gets put where it needs to, to go. Um, it doesn't get chucked into the ocean or into a river or anything like that. Um, so that's why a lot of the emphasis is on reducing instead of recycling because some of that stuff was, was always meant to be garbage. Um, it was never gonna be recycled. So if we can reduce what we're making, we can save resources and we can cut back on some of that pollution. I'll also say that a lot of the plastic in ocean is actually fishing gear, um, probably the, the largest percentage of plastic um, particles, microplastics and other things that are found in the ocean is actually from derelict fishing gear. So. That's a whole nother topic of discussion and um, presentation. But does that help answer that question? And does anyone else want to chime in? I didn't mean to want to take it over. No, that sounded that sounds great. Um, yeah, it, I think the kind of also the take home message is that when you put stuff in the when you put things in the garbage here in in our area, they're heading to very highly managed landfills with all sorts of um, uh, infrastructure to try and mitigate and manage the, you know, blowing debris um, to manage the um, leachate, which is the water that's cycling in the landfill and um, hydrogen sulfide and, and methane and, and some of the landfill gases. So when things are put in the garbage here, we know what's happening to them. Once they are exported, it is very difficult to know what's happening with anything. Um, kind of in regards to that, so um, let's see here. So don't be af necessarily afraid of the garbage if there's no better place uh, to put the, the things that you're trying to get rid of. Um, I do have a couple questions about uh, frozen food containers, maybe a little more discussion about uh, frozen food boxes, um, both kind of the card stock, frozen food boxes and then frozen food boxes that kind of look a little more like cardboard. Can you explain why those are not recyclable in the mixed recycling? You might've gone over it a little bit and maybe a little more detail if there's any other detail. Sure, or Maisel, do you want that one? Sure. So, um... Boxes that go into the freezer, like um, those frozen uh, pizza boxes, even butter, um, the, the butter boxes, um, those can actually go into the freezer too. 
Um, those also have a lining similar to paper plates and cups, um, this waxy coating. Um, so it makes it very hard, almost impossible to recycle them at the recycling facility. So um, they end up contaminating the whole paper source. So um, recycling facilities prefer if you put them in the garbage so they don't have to deal with that situation. Next question. All righty, great, thank you. I see I have a question here. Are there drop-off centers for food waste slash food scraps to compost? Um, there is not that I know of. I think there, you know, you can um, try composting at home. Worm bins are really great for managing food scraps um, and they're also very fun and very cute. Um, but other than that, there isn't really drop off for, um, for food scraps. There is for yard, sort of more general yard debris. Okay. Um, Can I okay. jump in with this one semi-related question that came through in the chat? Um, somebody asked about sugarcane based plastics. Um, and so I think they're kind of getting at, are, are these kind of bioplastics compostable? Oh no, you've asked a very loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> in our system, let's keep it just to specific to Washington County. <laughs> sure, um, so those are not accepted in the composting um, and it kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier where because there isn't sort of consistent standards for how something is composted or what being labeled as compostable or biodegradable means, um, there's just no way to guarantee that it will actually break down um, in our system. DEQ has also done some sort of interesting studies around um, life cycle analysis, sort of going back to what Maisel was sharing with the coffee, co coffee container example, that um, in some cases, the, the amount of resources that go into a biodegradable or compostable container is equivalent um, and sometimes maybe even slightly, slightly more um, impact than something that's made with petroleum. Um, and it, a lot of that has to do with um, ethanol, with corn production, and the amount of fossil fuels that goes into producing corn. Um, so it all gets very complicated and interesting, but kind of the takeaway was um, it doesn't really work in our system a lot of the time. It also doesn't really add anything to compost because it doesn't have the kind of nutrients and things that actual food does. So it's, you know, from a life cycle perspective, it, it might not be a win. The compost, um, last year, the compost facilities in the area all wrote a joint letter asking to please stop putting those things in there to, to not even be able to accept them anymore. Um, so maybe at some point in the future, we'll get to a point where those um, input impacts come down, where the system is be better able to uh, handle it. Um, but for right now, really using reusable things is the best possible option. Anything disposable, whether it's made out of cornstarch or sugar cane husk um, or plastic, it's always better to use something that's reusable if you can. Anyone else wanna jump in on that one? I think that covers it. Um, I'm just uh, answering a few more questions here. Let's see. Oh, let's see, scrap metal. Can I recycle screws, nails, and other leftover hardware as scrap metal? I'll answer this one. Um, so Kim and I were just talking about this. Um, so small scrap metal, um, because they, because they become loose in the recycling system. Um, it's helpful if you have a, um, a tin can container and you, you can collect all of your little scrap metals and put them in your can. And then when your can gets full, however big or small your can is, um, you can just crimp the top to make sure that they don't go loose and you just pop, in, pop them into your recycling bin. All right, good tips. I do have one about legislation if we want to ask about that and might just be a, a referral. Um, but let's see. 
how can we support the propose, proposal in the state legislature to ban the chasing arrow symbol on products? And then also what is the best way to put pressure on manufacturers regarding packaging choices? <laughs> that may be a little delicate, a little complex, but maybe there's a, um, a recommendation of a, of a website or um, just tips on who to contact. Sure, I wonder um, maybe if Kate or Heather can put in the, the link to, is it ORLIS, is that the right acronym, to the legislative uh, website that shares about all the bills? So, um, we, sorry, we, can't, we can't advocate one way or the other, um, but we can definitely encourage you to learn more about the bills, um, or actually the link to DEQ is probably the one. So if you head to the um, Department of Environmental Quality website, they're one of the main sponsors on the bill, um, and they have lots of really great fact sheets about what's in the bills um, and about what's happening with them as they move through the different committees. I know that it has been advancing and that they are um, still taking public comment. So of course, we always encourage people to offer public comment if it's something that you're interested in. In terms of manufacturers, I'd say, you know, I think there's, there's a bit of a feeling that they are starting to listen. I think what you have to be really mindful and what you know, I hope that you'll take away from this presentation is sort of being aware of what's maybe a little bit of greenwashing versus what can really make, uh, make a difference. Um, so encouraging them to not just switch all their packaging to you know, quote unquote biodegradable, but to actually cut back on the packaging that they're using or to offer reusable options or you know, to make things lighter, or thinner, or whatever, so to actually reduce the material that they're using. Um, but I think there's a lot of great movement around that, and I think consumer pressure is absolutely part of that. I don't, I don't have any specific tips for certain manufacturers or anything, and would, you know, probably get in trouble if I did, but I think that um, writing, calling, showing interest, showing your passion about that, definitely, I think it does make an impact um, as a consumer. Anyone else want to chime in? I think that was a good tip to put that website on in the chat. Um, if someone else has that ability to to grab that and, and drop that in there, that's great. Also, you can talk to your um, your local representative, your elected officials. Um, let's see. I can add a little to that last one too. Um, I know there are master recyclers on the west side that um, will. Uh, do will email their the stores that they go to um, when and request for things such as that. So that's also a possibility. Request for changes. Okay, I do have another question, um, and actually three of them kind of related to um, one of the slides when you're talking about plastics that should not go into the mixed recycling. Basically clamshells, some of those big containers you get at Costco with you know, cookies or um, I think someone mentioned squash, but basically is there a place that those can actually go or is it essentially just put them in the garbage um, barring you know, any special event or do some of them, is there a drop off facility that some of them some of them can go to depending on what type they are. Sure, um, I will say that it's 1 p.m. So I totally recognize if people wanna need to leave. We'll stay on for maybe another 10 minutes or so since it seems like there's still some questions in the queue. Um, and then also you can email us, you can uh, call our main line, you can head to our website. Um, if after, after we end, you have more questions. So the, the clamshells and those sort of bakery containers, I, I think you're talking about what like, you know, your dozen cookies or your croissants or whatever come in. Um, those are garbage um, and definitely need to be thrown out. One thing for reuse and not necessarily for like the blueberry clamshells, but more like the takeout containers with that sort of black plastic base and then lid. I have sometimes seen in my buy nothing group that people are looking, looking for those to um, package meals or um, free kitchens and, and things like that for food pantries. So you could try, check your buy nothing group and see if anybody wants them for that. But other than that, um, they would go in the garbage, yeah. Okay, yeah. And if, I'm gonna um, 
mention that if you have, there's a recycling facility, it's a drop-off facility. They do uh, accept styrofoam, polystyrene, but you do have to take it directly to them. It's not something that goes in the mixed recycling, but some of those containers might actually have a number six on them. And I know we talk about, don't look at the number, but sometimes when there's a drop-off facility or a special collection event, they will specify numbers because they're talking about very, very specific subset or category um, of an item. So it's called Agilix, or you can look it up on our garbage and recycling day, what to recycle where feature to find some of these more obscure options or these one-offs. Um, but yeah, generally there's nothing very permanent or it's not part of our collection, the collection program. And then one thing kind of related. So um, the clear plastic containers that are a little larger, but they're not completely round. They're still considered tubs, but they're not completely round. Like I said, um, are those okay or not okay? And maybe the, um, I'll see if I can get more specifics as to what was in there, but I'm thinking like salad, those salad tub things. Mm, I'm, I'm having a little hard time picturing. So maybe if the person who asked wants to send us a picture, my, my inclination is no, that it would be garbage. But if you email us a picture, we might be able to tell better. Perfect. Well, I, I just wanted to jump in because I believe Cheryl is asking this question and Cheryl also has her hand raised. Um, so maybe we could unmute her and see if she can provide just a little bit more info. Cheryl, you should have a notification on your screen that will allow you to unmute and ask your question. Hi, this is Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. I lost my volume for some reason. Um, there's a container specifically at Costco that they sell small chocolate chips in. It's about five by five by five and has a plastic lid, but it's clear. I mean, it's about the size of a large sour cream container. Heather, I'm throwing this one to you. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, without seeing it, it's really hard to say. So maybe Cheryl, if you wouldn't mind sending us a photo to our email. Okay. Recycle at co.washington.or.us. And that. yeah, then that we can be a little more um, confirm exactly uh, if it is a yes or a no. And then, you know, if it's something we don't already have in our what to recycle and where app as a lookup item, then I'll put it in there so that everybody can find out whether or not it goes or not. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. I I'm kind of, uh, I just have a few more questions that I think I'm going to answer um, just directly with the, uh, the askers. So I, I think I'm pretty much done with the questions on my end. You know, I had one come through on the chat um, about textile recycling um, or clothing recycling. So does anybody have any recommendations for um, how to recycle old clothes? Hi, I'll answer that. Um, I guess it depends on if those old clothes are still usable or whether or not they're more like rag textiles. Um, if they are reusable, the best bet would be to donate them to um, a homeless shelter or houseless organizations or organizations that deal with um, houseless folks, um, community organizations, 
And if they're more just like rags, you can either make them into rags, um, put it on the buy, one of your local buy nothing groups, see if anybody needs them. Um, uh, maybe for some art projects, especially if there's some really cool textiles. And um, if not, you can also, um, I'll drop a link to um, Gemtext. I don't know if there's any locations in Washington County, but um, I've dropped the location for their map and they do uh, textile recycling. So, but that would be for a last resort, unless those things are just straight up rags. Any other questions, Heather? Nope. I just have a few more that I'm answering um, just directly. And um, so I think I'm, I think I've, we've answered the, the last of them. I just need to stay on just a little bit longer to finish these up. Kate, did you see any other questions in the chat um, that we can answer in the next two minutes? Yeah, um, I had one that asked, is the general public allowed to check out the recycling facilities? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, is the general public allowed to check out or tour recycling facilities? That is actually a good question. Um, during COVID, I know more than likely not. Um, but do you know, Kate, if um, they will be allowed to um, tour afterwards or generally pre-COVID, were they allowed to have public tours? Um, I do know that the Mass Recyclers Program um, the mass recyclers that um, enroll in the mass recycler program, they do have a couple tours in there where they are allowed to, um, as a group, tour the recycling facilities. Um, but as far as individual um, community members, I'm not sure. Maybe Kate has the answer for that. Basically, check with the facility, but also look um, directly like at the organizations like Solid Waste and Recycling or Clark County for, is one example that I know they've been doing some Google Earth tours that are really cool. Yeah, I can't okay. think of any facilities that are really set up for drop-in options. And um, just cause it is like, it's, uh, there's a lot of machinery. There's a lot of things happening. There's front end loaders and stuff moving around. So I think in generally they're sort of sort of disinclined to have people drop by. Um, but very far in the future, you know, Metro is working on the idea of a West Side transfer station. Um, and I think part of that would be would would be to have some educational opportunities um, for tours and things as well. But that's pretty far in the future. So unfortunately I don't know of a lot of local um, options to for facilities. Um, I did see a question in the Q&A. Let's see if Heather's gotten to it yet that I was going to answer. Um, so I, there's a question. Family in Washington and California can put glass and clamshells in their recycling. Why is it different in Oregon? So the putting glass in recycling or not putting glass in recycling, um, there was sort of this trade-off of if we put everything in one bin, then overall, you know, if we don't ask people to sort, then we'll get more stuff overall. So some places went to this, you know, put everything in and we'll sort it out again later approach. Um, but what happens with glass is that it breaks. So when glass breaks inside that mixed recycling bin and you get little bits of glass mixed in with everything else, it can actually lower the overall value of the recycling because if you're trying to shake little glass shards out of your paper, um, you don't want glass in going through the paper recycling process. So um, the idea for it was that, you know, you can get more yield, but the downside is that contamination. So um, Oregon decided to do more of this sort of two stream recycling where we still have the mixed bin that takes paper, plastic, um, and metal, and then to keep the glass on the side to prevent that contamination. And, you know, for people who have lived or traveled elsewhere, other countries have uh, even more stringent sorting systems where you have all of the different bins for different materials to keep each of those streams cleaner. So 
that's the reason that we have the um, tube in system and why it's really important to keep glass out of the mixed recycling and um, to help keep it clean and to make sure it gets recycled. So it is just about 1.15. So thank you all so much for coming. I think we'll leave this up for a second longer because Heather's still answering the last few questions in the Q&A. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. I hope you'll come to some of our other um, webinars that we're hosting this month and bring your great questions. And again, you're always welcome to uh, contact us, email us, call us, um, and we're, we're happy to help out. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Bye, everyone.